Welcome to the HMO Property Show by investors for investors. Brought to you by the HMO Property Co., Australia's leaders in impact investing. Investments made with the intention to generate a measurable, beneficial social or environmental impact alongside a positive financial return. Catch us weekly as we discuss all things cash flow positive property investing. Welcome back to the HMO Property Show. I'm your host, Neil Gibb, and today I've got a very special guest from BMT Tax Depreciation. It's Mr. Bradley Beer. Bradley, welcome to the podcast. Neil, great to be here. Love talking property tax depreciation. It's always good fun. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm excited for this one because it's an area that I get a lot of questions around. Um, because traditionally depreciation has been used to make negatively geared properties positively geared. Is that right? Yeah, kind of. I guess it's a tax deduction and that's uh, often, I guess, it, it, it does achieve that. Uh, but you've also got a cash flow and you've got to pay the interest, right? Yes. <laughs> but that's good as well, isn't it? Sometimes when we can, if we're paying tax, it means we're making money, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, when I complain to my uh, accountant about paying tax, sometimes he's like, well, you paid lots of tax because you made more money this year. So, okay. Yes. Good problem <laughs> to have. It's, uh, it's not a bad thing. Yes. And... Bradley, you are also the first guest that I've had on the HMO Property Show that's put together a slide deck. So thank you very much for this, mate. This is going to be really good on YouTube. If you're listening on the podcast, head over to the YouTube channel and check this out because it's we've got a lot of slides. We've actually done some, or we, so Bradley and his team have done some live um, examples on an established HMO and a new built HMO as well. So Brad, you can take it away, mate. Sure. Excellent. Uh, great to be here, Neil. I've been very, um, you know, uh, you know, nearly 25 years at BMT, so very keen on uh, depreciation. Been a property investor for 20 of those years or so myself. Um, so I love to buy, love to renovate, although renovating is not as fun these days. Uh, um, and, um, you know, hold some properties and it's been, been a good journey. It's made some money over time as well, which is great. Mm. Uh, BMT, national business. We've been in business for well, nearly 26 years, which I've been here most of. I am the CEO. I run the business, have a team of about 200 people spread around the country. Wow. Done about 650-odd thousand depreciation schedules in total. I didn't do them all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I've done a few, although we were much slower at it back when I started. Um, we got a bit better at technology since then uh, to yeah, make things happen a bit fantastic. faster. Um, but it's been a good journey. We've done obviously lots of schedules, and uh, it's been some interesting, uh, some interesting times on the way. Um, coming from a from a little spare room business when I started, I was the first employee. The where we are today has been uh, has been absolutely very interesting. Yeah, um, fantastic, mate. Well done on the growth of that as well. That's huge. Two hundred employees is not an easy team to manage. Uh no, but you know, we've got some structure in place. I've got. My executive team have been with me for nearly for you know twenty and twenty two years. Uh, the three of us that run and uh, now own the business together um, has been um, uh, just having people around you for such a long time that uh, are aligned and we get to work together and still work together after that amount of time quite effectively. It's been been good and uh, you know growing that team organically over over time uh, or growing the business organically from the start over that period of time. So. And we uh, hold, you know, the most of the market share of these schedules, probably half of it, roughly, mm -hmm. in the country. Uh, guys spread all over the place, and you know, it's been been a great journey. Yeah, fantastic. Well done, mate. Anyway, so depreciation—that's where we're going to go today, aren't we? Yes. <laughs> we should get to that one. What do you reckon, Neil? <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess what is it? People, when you talk about buying property, we want them to go up in value, and people say to me, "But I want it to appreciate." Uh, well, unfortunately or fortunately, whatever you want to call it, the uh, the building itself wears out. We we understand depreciation a little bit better when we talk about a car. We buy it, we drive it out of the shop, <laughs> it depreciates in value. We get that one. <laughs> Let's think about that. Yeah. Uh, and if you use that um, car as a, as a um, uh, for an invest for investment, so for work, then you'll be able to claim depreciation for that wear and tear on the car. Mm -hmm. With property, it's got some similarity uh, in that even though we want the value to go up, your carpet wears out. So do your bricks and mortar and so does your stove and all those things. So the tax office says we're allowed to make a deduction for that loss in value against that item mm -hmm. or that property or the items in that property, I suppose. Even though the overall asset value should be increasing, 
the actual value of your carpet or stove or, or items there is decreasing, decreasing over time. The tax office lets us claim a deduction for that. Usually the second biggest deduction an investor will make. First one's interest. That's going well at the moment. Uh, <laughs> so uh, um, the second one uh, is, is depreciation against that property. I guess for a gauge, the average first year deduction out of all the properties we did last financial year, 40 something thousand of them, was just under ten thousand uh, dollars. So, you know, that's the average. So, some more, some less, obviously. Uh, but that's the average amount of deduction. And obviously, you know, ten thousand dollars is a pretty solid deduction. So, the more of those yeah. we can find, the better. Absolutely. Um, that's where we are. Why do uh, why do quantity surveyors get involved? Uh, so, I'm a quantity surveyor, which is someone who's I've done a building degree. So, I'm not a uh, um, I'm, I'm out of that. I, so I've done a building degree, not an accountant. Out of that, I come out with a um, with some quantity surveying ability, which is someone who measures and estimates the cost of buildings. So we can get a set of plans. Uh, we can measure everything up. We can count the bricks for you if you want. Uh, that's what a quantity surveyor kind of does. Um, yeah. We count bricks and we tell you how much it should cost to put them there. Yeah. So we will get a set of plans, measure everything up, say, you know, there's 10,000 bricks, this many metres of concrete, this much steel, this much carpet, and we'll estimate how much it should cost to build. Mm -hmm. And the tax office, so the depreciation claims actually relate to the construction cost and the value of things in the in the building, and the tax office says that they'll accept an estimate by a relevant professional such as a quantity surveyor to come up with those costs. Mm -hmm. So there's two pieces. One is coming up with those costs, and then there's also knowing the rules after that. So knowing what we can claim, and knowing how to specialise in the and in in maximising those deductions is important. Obviously, knowing the um, the the you know from a compliance point of view, we need the construction cost work done, and after that, how do we get the most out of it? What do we claim at a higher rate? Uh, hence, we work alongside the accountant. We're not accountants. Uh, we come up with the costs. We visit the property as part of the process. And we put values on things and come up with a number that your accountant claims in the tax return. Mm -hmm. They're our friends. They're not. They're not. We're not instead of. Uh, we we um, we play alongside them, and most of the work we do actually comes uh, referred by accountants. You know, mm -hmm. people come and people buy properties and uh, maybe aren't as educated as some of your clients, Neil, and yep. listen to things like this. <laughs> they come. They go to their accountant. They say, you know, depreciation schedule. What's that? Uh, and you know. Send them off to us often to get a depreciation schedule done. Yeah, that's. And how long that's does it take? Of, how long does it take to become a, a quantity surveyor, and what's the what's the qualification that's required for one? So I spent four years and I did a building degree. That's that um, gives you your basic quantity surveying knowledge as well. But then you need to do another two years of logbook experience uh, working as a quantity surveyor in some way, which you submit to the Institute of Quantity Surveyors, and you sit through some some uh, um, interviews with them to make sure you know what you're doing and then you come out and then you've got to do your CPD points, uh, continuing professional development points each year to make sure your eyes kept in there basically. But, yeah, so it was really four years, but it's not um, it's not only quantity surveying you're doing a building degree. You learn how to be a project manager. You learn how to do a bunch of stuff, but one of those things that comes out of there is quantity surveying, which is, you know, I was partway through uni when I started and got work experience at BMT and here I am nearly 25 years later. <laughs> <laughs> the same place. <laughs> um, so now I think the easiest easiest way to get a gauge of what it means if we claim, it, it, what depreciation does to a scenario is to run run some cash flows on a property and say what happens if we do or don't claim depreciation. Um, and for the purpose of today, we've got something that you guys have been involved with, or two that you guys have been involved involved with. Mm -hmm. And let's just run through some of the numbers and go. Well, what happens if we? Do or don't claim depreciation. Obviously, you'll see what the cash flows look like um, for 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 investors. So, we've taken one here. It's in uh, uh, Carlisle in WA uh, that you guys had. Um, uh, that it's a new build, so yep. new uh, new property, uh, five bedrooms, four bathrooms. Um, the average rent per room is three hundred and sixty-five dollars or eighteen hundred and twenty-five dollars in total per week, mm -hmm. which is solid for the construction cost, which is great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, we, we, we started yeah. this one pre-COVID, uh, so the construction prices were quite low on this one. Uh, the same construction today on that would be about five hundred thousand uh, dollars. Another another hundred thousand dollars? Did you say? Yeah, that's probably yeah, probably about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars more. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Uh, yeah, they've gone up. Yeah. I know. I just um, 
pre-COVID, I built a house and I've got to build another house in the same block. And the the quote's like one hundred and fifty thousand dollars more for the for the for the second house. That's very similar to the first house uh, <laughs> that I just got through that day. And I went, surely yeah. that's not right. Um, but, and then anyway, that's that's the way the construction costs have gone. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so the total income for this property now is ninety one thousand two hundred and fifty dollars. Uh, we're going to this construction cost was about five hundred and fifty five hundred eighty thousand dollars. I think from from memory. Uh, uh, we've got about $550,000 worth of depreciation, which means there'd be some other costs outside of that. Uh, but the, the base construction cost is around that mid fives area. So we're going to have some expenses, interest. We've allowed some interest, some, you know, insurances, management fees, all those sorts of things that you need to pay, uh, on a property of that, that, that caliber of that, cons- that cost is likely to be about $50,000 for the year. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. Great cash flow, it's $38,000 or $700 a week, over $700 a week positive to start with, which is which is a, which is a great starting point. Um, what happens uh, is that when you make money, you've got to pay some tax. So uh, you will um, um, have a have a total cash flow of $38,000 or $700 a week roughly. You'll need to pay a tax on that if it's adding to your other income at $0.37 cents of the dollar, which is where sort of most property investors sit where we run this scenario. Changes if you're obviously at a higher uh, tax rate, uh, but um, you'll need to pay some tax um, of about fourteen thousand dollars on that, uh, which is right. Yes, yep. um, and uh, sorry, my my head maths was was struggling there for a second. <laughs> oh, is it right? Yes, it is. Um, so your net cash flow after is about four sixty five a week, or about twenty four thousand one hundred and sixty dollars for the year. Um, with depreciation, we've found on this property because it's been built and uh, has full furniture package. There's a lot more depreciation on that. We'll get into why in a moment, but the depreciation, remember I said the total, the average for the year is 10. This one's actually got $28,000 worth of depreciation, uh, which is which is lots for yeah. what's been spent to build. But, but furniture gets a higher rate of depreciation. You also have to replace it at some point as well, yeah. um, et cetera, and you have to buy it, but that's, that's the way it goes. It's $28,000 in depreciation in the first year. So the the total now that you need to pay tax on, because that depreciation is a tax deduction, like you wear and tear on your items, your car's wearing out, your carpet's wearing out, that's where this depreciation comes from, but it's a non-cash tax deduction. So you don't pay out $28,000, you just get to make a deduction of $28,000 uh, that that uh, is is non non paid, right? <laughs> which is which is the which are the good ones. Beautiful. So now we're only going to pay tax on not thirty eight thousand, but on ten thousand dollars, because ten thousand dollars is our uh, is our is is our cash flow after depreciation or, or the, the amount we need to pay tax on after depreciation has been taken into account because it's a tax deduction. So now our tax is three thousand seven hundred dollars um, for the year. Um, and our net cash flow goes from twenty four thousand to thirty four thousand uh, dollars for the year, or four sixty five to six hundred and sixty dollars a week through claim and depreciation against that property. Um, difference of two hundred dollars a week if you do or don't claim depreciation. Should you or should you not? <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, and look, my job on that whole page is that we just come up with that depreciation number. Um, but this is an actual scenario, one that you guys have done, um, and I, hopefully that's in line with the information provided at the start. Um, but my my thing here is to point out why we should claim, why, you know, the difference depreciation makes as opposed to just being a, um, this is this is what you buy or why you buy it. That's your job, Neil. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, this is where we need the team around us. Um, to do that piece. Yeah, so exactly. claiming or not claiming, it makes a pretty substantial difference, which is, which is great. So the total deduction is the first year, 28,000, over five years, 125,000 over the full life of the property, we've got about $550,000, which is basically most of your construction and furniture costs, less a few consultants fees maybe, or a few um, soft landscaping and things up front that are left out of the total that may have been spent, other developments, uh, non-direct construction related expenses may be, may be left out, but and land is left out as well, obviously. Yep. Uh, but, um, there's your spend and there's there's the difference it makes by claiming depreciation, which is great. Incredible. Scenario two. Now, I've run one here now that uh, is another property and it's in uh, Port Kennedy. Uh, this was an older, well, not that old, 1999 built house. 
um, that was purchased for four hundred and thirty-five thousand um, dollars. Now, in what you guys do and getting some more multi multi living there, Ford spent some money one hundred and twenty-five thousand on renovations, mm -hmm. uh, increased from four to six bedrooms, two to four bathrooms, and redid some kitchen and laundry appliances, flooring, lighting, and fire equipment. Um, I think there's about ten thousand dollars worth of fire equipment in this property, yep. um, which is obviously a requirement uh, when you put some multi multi living in there, Neil. So. That's the base scenario. The rent. What I've done. What I've done with this is I've I've, I've made it into a uh, a let's run it before and afterwards. Now this renovation's obviously been done, but if you didn't renovate it, I've done what would have happened with or without depreciation. What would happen with or without depreciation if you do rental it? Re do um do uh, done the renovation, which is being done. So the second half of the scenario is the real scenario, um, but <laughs> I guess it points out the difference in in uh, depreciation across yeah, the two brilliant. as well. Rental income potential about five hundred and sixty a week or thirty thousand dollars a year. I haven't gone, I haven't got as much detail here to run through, but we'll just have a look at the numbers. Expenses, interest, twenty seven. So you you you're still cash flow positive just with the house that was bought at those sort of rentals at the at the purchase price with. Without uh, without depreciation, you know, it's uh, um, assuming you pay some tax on that. It's going to be about twelve hundred bucks a year positive after after you pay your tax at thirty seven cents in the dollar on that couple of thousand dollars that you made there. Depreciation on that slightly older property, not as much. Uh, there's some real changes we'll touch on later, but don't worry too much about them because it's built a fair few years ago and you bought it second hand. You don't get to claim some things. The depreciation would be about four thousand two hundred per year on that property, which would be the same each year. Uh, uh, we'll just keep it, keep in mind that 4250 number for, for some future uh, reference here. Um, so with uh, with depreciation, our cost or our, our cash flow turns into $54 a week or about $2,800 per year because we're actually making a $4,200 deduction, which means we don't pay tax on the couple of thousand dollars that we were positive. And we also get a couple of extra thousand dollars there in that gets written off against other income and ends up being the after-tax cost at $54 positive per week. And uh, assuming those tax rates on both, $2,808 a year. A little bit of a difficult scenario because you're actually a positive cash flow property that turns into a negatively geared property with yeah. depreciation. Yeah. Um, so if you don't understand that, Neil, maybe there's another podcast on that for you there. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> The, the, the end figure is that by doing depreciation on this property, it's $30 a week difference. It's $54 a week positive instead of $24 a week positive, basically. Yeah. Um, so still not uh, still not too bad. Now, after we renovated, we said $125,000 was spent. Uh, rental increase, which you gave us numbers here, to $1,290 a week by doing it as a, as a multi, um, multi, multi, uh, multi house, what do we call it? House of... House of multiple application. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> I'm trying to get my um, <laughs> tongue around those words. Um, so sixty-seven thousand dollars a year. The expenses will have increased because we've had to borrow or whatever the hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars from somewhere. So we've increased some expenses around uh, interest there for the purpose of this scenario. Say forty-one thousand uh, dollars. The cash flow is still three hundred dollars a week, or about fifteen, nearly sixteen thousand dollars per year after we've done that renovation. So that. Renovation and make it get the multi tenants <laughs> worked really well in this scenario as well. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. Uh, depreciation is substantially increased again here. Now we've got the original claim that was still there, but because you've done some renovation, some more work on it, you're putting more cost there, more value there. It's also been furnished, so there's some furniture being put in there. So the depreciation jumps up from the four thousand to seventeen thousand in the first year. That won't be seventeen thousand every year. It sort of declines over time, but the first year is about seventeen thousand one hundred dollars. So now we've got a, a tax deduction of seventeen thousand dollars. We had, uh, you know, about eighteen thousand dollars of cash flow before, uh, basically. So we're almost getting back to not paying a lot of tax on that uh, on that cash flow that came in uh, after depreciation. We end up with twenty two thousand dollars. A year, um, uh, positive incomes, four hundred and twenty-eight dollars a week, and um, one hundred and twenty-two dollars a week difference in claiming depreciation or not claiming depreciation after that renovation, six thousand three hundred dollars a year. Pretty big difference in cash flow. It's incredible, um, hey? 
So the, the right-hand side is, is looking at the, the first way we run the numbers on the first page, I suppose, with a bit more detail, and they're the numbers that poke out of that when you claim that depreciation number of, once again, $17,144, which is a, a good result. Brilliant. Um, and the depreciation, the, the depreciation on the renovation is, isn't as high as the new build uh, depreciation because depreciation is already being claimed on this property. Is that correct? Uh, it isn't as high as the new bill because of the the actual uh, money that's so the original construction cost that makes up part of that depreciation, right. which is and it's not because it's been claimed; it's actually because it costs less to build back in 1999. So if you had built that structure again today, or you know pre-COVID or now, yeah, <laughs> it would be a big yep. difference. But back in 1999, we estimate what it would have cost to build that house back then. The original claims against that house will be going for, for 40 years against that original structure. So you've still got some years of the original structure left of a claim, which we'll get into in a bit in the next slide, actually. Uh, and then you've got um, the, the new work that's been done. Uh, some of that has claims over 40 years or the plant over shorter periods of time. But it's a sort of a combination reason there, Neil. But a part of it relates to really the original construction cost being less and being a purchase that's happened recently you can't claim on some of the existing plant equipment um which we'll get into a little bit later but yeah it's a, there's a combination of reasons but one of those is you know when things cost more to build when they're new uh they are brand new they cost more you get more depreciation there's a simple fact yeah new also gets more because of some real changes that happened the last few years as well but anyway it's still an incredible outcome it is it's a great yeah. outcome from yeah. a, from a cash flow point of view it's a fantastic outcome Obviously, you'd hope, you know, there's some value uplift in doing some of those renovations as well. Neil, I didn't didn't put that in there, but I think it's a four. Uh, the purchase price was, what was the purchase price? I can't remember now, 400 and... Um, 420, 420. And it's, you know, I don't know if you have a view on value, but it's probably more like six, more like 700, I suppose, by the end of that. Um, but I'm only plucking there, really. I'm not a valuer. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, we've had... Did some. We've We've had some buyers, uh, some clients purchase using standard residential finance. And then we've got some lenders that um, value these based on a commercial basis. So they do a commercial val and it gives them a huge increase based on the returns that they're creating. Uh, we've had and so you, I guess you end up with a slightly less LVR, but because your value is so much increased, then you end up with more, more loan against it potentially anyway, right? They're still doing 80% LVRs as well, even though they've got a commercial val, but it's still a residential package. Okay. Oh, yeah. That's, so that's... Some, of, some of our clients are pulling quite a lot of the renovation costs and some of the equity back out as well. Great. Love that. Love that stuff. That was how I got, I, you know, I started off with nothing in my property investing journey, Neil, and uh, saved up the first bit of deposit. And after that, it was buy, revalue, sorry, buy, renovate, revalue, buy, renovate, revalue, pull the cash back out, yep. rinse and repeat. That was uh, many, many, many of those done by me over the last 20 years. Uh, not so many in the last few years, a bit busy, but uh, they've all performed, uh, a lot of them performed very well by learning how to do that stuff, which is great. Great. Uh, now, two main areas of depreciation. Let's get a little bit technical, but not too much, but a bit. <laughs> First, um, there's, there's two, two, two spots, I suppose you'd say, that you claim. One's against the structure of the building. Uh, the other one is against the, what we call the plant equipment. This one, the structure, Division 43, Capital Works, they call it, it's on the structure. In order to claim it, it needs to be built after 1987. But what it is, is 2.5% of the actual structural cost, the hard stuff, concrete floors, walls and roof, things that last a long time. 2.5% mm -hmm. uh, of the actual cost when it was built each year. Um, it, goes, it starts from when it's built, um, it has to be built after 1987. Uh, and continues on for 40 years, which is basically claiming the whole value. So that 2.5% times 40 is, is, is claiming all of it. So if a house like this one is built in 2015, costs $300,000 to build the structural component, then you'll get $7,500 as a Division 43 building allowance claim each year from 2015 until 2055. If you buy it now in 2022, you don't get the first seven years, you just get the, the remaining 33 years. Gotcha. Yep. Now, with that renovation scenario there, it's built in 1999. So we've put a construction cost on that at the time and pokes out that 4250 So that puts it at a construction cost of about 300 My head, head mass is not awesome, but 340 or 360 grand or something. 
back then for the structure of that house, basically, yeah. um, coming out to that original Division 43 deduction as part of that overall deduction uh, on that first house. So it costs more to build houses now, but anyway, this, this particular component, once again on that renovation, um, this building allowance also applies to some renovation works that have been done. So the new kitchen and bathroom um, and some of those other, I guess, structural type works. I'll say structural. It's also anything hard. Like the kitchen is seen as a building allowance, a part of the building that you claim over that 40 years. Yeah, The okay. stove is not, but the kitchen is. So yep. a lot of those renovations would have fallen into this area and we get 2.5% of them. Uh, 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 based on the cost of what happened to them uh, over that time. Mm. And with the, um, just while we're on that, Brad, they, do yeah. all quantity surveyors use the same valuation method for construction? So if we need to go back to 1999, for instance, do all QSs look at the same data? They should. Yeah. <laughs> they have to. Yeah. Well, when they look at the same data, there's there's a there's a published data called the B, uh, BPI, which is a bit like the CPI. Consumer price index. There's a BPI, building price index. It's done a little differently now, but for, for ease, because they discontinued it. But for ease, let's call it that. Um, there's a building price indice that will say that if a, if a brick costs this much today, 20 years ago, that brick and to put it there okay. um, should cost a, a certain percentage of that. A certain percentage of that, basically. So they should all be. You, you do need to apply. Um, something to come up with what a construction cost would have been at the time it was actually built for that building allowance. Yeah, absolutely. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, uh, the other component of depreciation that we get to, to claims, what we call or what's called plant equipment or some people call it chattels. Um, these are things like air conditioners, cooktops, hot water services, usually mechanical things, things that don't last as long, cars, <laughs> for example. <laughs> um, and also furniture because it's loose stuff. Right, things that don't last as long. The tax office puts what they call an effective life on them. So, for the purpose of this, we, we should use the example in front of us, right, to make it easy. <laughs> the tax office says a dishwasher should have a life of about eight years. So, we kind of get to claim its value over the eight years, as opposed to forty if it's part of the building, um, effectively. So, mm -hmm. um, there's a couple of different ways to to work out the rate, because I know 25% doesn't work out times eight to be the total value. <laughs> um, <laughs> but there's a couple of different methods, and one's yeah. called the prime cost, one's the diminishing value, which is effectively twice the prime cost rate and gets claimed at the percentage of it that's left each year. Mm. A dishwasher at a, at a $1,360 cost uh, would have a diminishing value rate of 25%, get $340 in the first year, uh, with its effective life of eight years, effectively. And in the second year, this dishwasher would get 25% of $1,020, basically, as a tax deduction. In the third year, it would get 25% of whatever's left. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 800 and something, we'll say, just for ease, um, basically. So in order to claim this stuff, the plant and equipment, uh, it needs to be either new. Uh, so... so you used to be able to claim it on any plant equipment. We'd look at a house and we'd see a stove that looks five or 10 years old and we put a value on it and you claim it. In residential properties in uh, um, 2017, they made some change and now any plant equipment needs to be new or installed by you to actually claim it. You can't claim it on anything previously used. So basically when you buy a property, if it's new, you get to claim it. If it's secondhand, you don't. If you build it or if you renovate it and you put it in, you do get to claim it effectively. Um, so, um, you know, just to make it more difficult for people in the world, <laughs> they uh, have made some of those changes. It does make a bit of difference to the claims, but the more of this stuff, the better. This is what the furnished, when we've got good examples here, where the furnished property gets really high deductions and a lot of that comes down to the furniture. Now, yeah. I don't say furnish it for... For high depreciation, furnish it because you get more rent. Furnish it for other reasons. <laughs> One of the benefits is the cash flow is the is the depreciation that comes out of that that helps with the cash flow in the end after tax uh, yeah. because you get to claim deductions. Sort of. I've got furnished properties, and you know I've got to replace more things, but I get more depreciation, right? Yeah, um, yeah. and uh, I get more rent from that property at the same time have being furnished because of what it is. So if we've got a HMO, for instance, we've got a six bedroom, six bathroom house, and we've got an air conditioning unit in each room. And one of the air conditioning units breaks, uh, and say we're in year four of the eight-year cycle. Can we then 
do we need to get a new schedule drawn up to say we've got a new air conditioning unit in there or can it be added and amended to an existing look, schedule? Yeah, you know, look, look at you, Neil. You've already you've covered scrapping for me almost. <laughs> <laughs> um, the answer is uh, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that in a moment, yeah. but uh, the answer is you don't need a new schedule. What you do is you write off what's left of the old air conditioner because there's still some value left. You scrap mm-hmm. it. And the new, uh, the new hot, the new hot water service, uh, um, the new air conditioner. You actually add to the schedule, and you can do that very easily without even coming to see me. We've got an online portal where your schedule sits. You can go and put a new air conditioner on this date for this much money, and it'll fix up your numbers and give them back to you and your account in the following Beautiful. year, um, really? basically. So very easy, to be, easy to be done. And uh, when we get to scrapping, we'll go back to your example because you've already used it now. Really? Sorry <laughs> for jumping. <laughs> um, just just on those uh, depreciation changes we talked about on in in 2017, the the just to recap, I guess um, the only thing that is affected because one thing that happened, I know it's now five six years six years ago, it's 2000, you know, six odd years ago, uh, but lots of people sort of think now if it's old, maybe we don't get to claim stuff. Um, I still hear accountants going, "Hasn't that changed? What do you guys do now?" Uh, which is not the case. So old property still gets deductions. It just doesn't get as many as it used to. So, you know, we look at a scenario here, something bought in, you know, bought now, if it was new for $700,000, might get, say, $14,500. But if it was two years old, might get $8,200. Prior to these changes, that two-year-old one might get $13,000 in its first year if you bought it now. What it's meant, or might have got 12, right? Um, What it's meant is that slightly old property um, gets not as much as it used to get. And the reason is because of that plant equipment. That plant equipment gets a lot of deductions in the early years because obviously you claim high percentages. If you can't claim that, you're claiming against the structure of the building, which, as we say, here makes up 85 or 90% of the total claim, but it's spread over 40 years as opposed to some of these things getting claimed uh, earlier and, and more upfront. Commercial properties, no change. New resident properties, no change. Uh, it's just that secondhand residential property that has some change to those. Uh, to those to those um those items now one to be wary of there which is i think 20 just over 20 percent of the time on our numbers people buy a property they move into it they may get a grant they live in it for six months or whatever you've got to and then they move out of it and make it a rental property mm-hmm. you get affected by this legislation don't get to claim your plant equipment if you do do that um, right. something to be uh to, to be considerate of i suppose um Anyway, changes. They weren't fun, by the way. I didn't like those ones very much. <laughs> made my life a little bit hard. Yeah, but it did. <laughs> um, so old property still gets deductions. A couple of examples here. Um, Two-bedroom unit 05, $6,700. Three-bedroom house built in 95, four and a half. That really lines up with our scenario, doesn't it? We had 4800 mm. um, on a 99 built home, so uh, lining up pretty close. Yep. Um, obviously, there's 14 years left on the, the 1995 home. Um, and there's 24 years left on the unit that's built in 2005, which gives us, rounds out those 40 years of claims, basically. Just a couple of ideas of example of what sort of deductions come out of some older properties. Commercial properties, um, do all sorts of properties, don't just do residential stuff. Uh, we do um, everything from, you know, the Melbourne Eye to the big rocking horse, giant rocking horse in Adelaide to docks to pubs to anything, basically. Lots of farms been done over the last uh, last period of time as well. They've got some... Pretty, pretty funky rules around them these days that allow some additional deductions. But, you know, retail shops here, just an idea, you know, 1,500 square meter retail shop, um, $36,000 in the first year. There's obviously lots of fit out that you can claim in those sorts of things. So anyway, if you're into any commercial sort of properties, anybody, um, then there's, uh, there's, there's some claims potentially to be made by either the owner of the building or the tenant if they've done a fit out in commercial properties, which is often the the one where um, uh, you want to make sure you're taking proper advantage of. Yeah. A few frequently asked questions. Uh, most people, when you say you're a points of aid doing depreciation, go, don't I, doesn't my accountant look after my taxes? Uh, we work alongside them, as we said before, we're the cost guy. We come up with the cost and we are friendly with the accountant. Most, the, the biggest source of work that we do comes when someone's accountant says go and get one of these things and they listen mm. and they go and do it basically so we, we we're friendly with them the, dip, the other thing is we actually go and visit the property they trust the numbers we come up with because they can mm-hmm. uh, um, so when when people think i've got a good account that looks after that yes you've got a good account that looks after 
you know, your general health, but we're the ear specialist, I suppose. <laughs> <It's a depreciation laughs> specialist, Make sure we get that bit right. Um, too old, I'm going to harp on that all day because I should, because I still hear it most days. People go, but it's old. Isn't it too old? Doesn't it need to be built up to this date? Forget about age. You're never too old to ask the question uh, is what I would say. If we tell you it's too old and there's nothing, there's too old and there's nothing. But yeah. uh, if anyone else does, without that knowledge that we do after, I don't know, 650-odd thousand times, um, we will we will tell you if there's nothing in there. So always just ask with the, with the address of the property, we can have a look at a few photos and get an idea of whether it's worth doing before we go ahead and spend any money. Mm. Um, and we we even back that with a with a um, with a guarantee that says we'll we'll double the, the the fee and deductions in the first year, or we'll give you the money back. We don't we if, if we think it's worth it, we'll back that. Uh, if we're wrong, then we won't charge you and we'll move on um, effectively um, because yep. if, if there's not enough there. What about renovations? Back to your question, Neil. If uh, if you renovate. So let's think about it even a little bit bigger than just throwing away your, your, your air conditioner that breaks down. But if you renovate and you rip out things that were there that still had some claimable value left, then you're scrapping and throwing away some value, then there's some, some value to that scrapping that's a potential instant deduction in the year that you um, rip them out. So when I've done renovations in the past and I've thrown away a stove that's you know, it might be a bit old, but we had some value on it at the time. Um, it, it was operating; it was doing its job. We put a value on that. You throw it away, and you make some deductions for the for the the, the residual value that was there. Yeah. The important thing is, force before you rip it apart. I mean, all, all what we're doing is we're doing a depreciation schedule on what's there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then you're actually just ripping part of that out. But we need to get some evidence of what's there. So if we need to back you an audit, it's pretty hard to back you an audit with. Um, no information about what was there. So we want to see it first and then we can go and estimate the value of those things and make sure we get the deductions out of them. But it can be because you decide to throw them away for renovation or it can be because you your air conditioner in one of the rooms broke down, you've got to replace it, you write off what's left in that year and uh, start depreciating the new one effectively. Paying back Miss Dolls. Now, if you've, if you've already got properties uh, and you haven't been claiming it properly or getting everything you can out of it, uh, we think from some research that around 70% of owners are not maximising depreciation deductions because they thought it was too old. They thought their accountant looked after it. I don't know what they thought. They just didn't know, I suppose. Yep. Um, and that, that goes for whether you were claiming nothing or whether you were just claiming not as much as you could claim. If you don't pay tax, the tax office finds you eventually right, sends you a fine and tells you you need to pay it. Yep. If you don't... Uh, if you don't claim your depreciation, you can go back and amend your tax return pretty easily for up to two years and go, you know what, I should have paid, paid, claimed $7,000 in depreciation last year. Can we amend my tax return and get some money back, please, Mr. Tax Office? Yes, you can, pretty easily for two years. Now, it could be a scenario where you were claiming $5,000 and you really could have, and, you know, with a guess or however that happened, I don't know, uh, a bad <laughs> depreciation schedule, you're claiming $5,000 and you should really be able to claim like $10,000 or $9,000. You can actually go back and claim the difference. A lot of our industry, especially through COVID, have resorted to doing depreciation schedules without looking at the properties because that was easier. Uh, we didn't um, because we want to get it right and get the maximum deduction. So if you're yeah. only getting $5,000 because you didn't look at it, and you can get nine, you want nine, right? Yeah, absolutely. Because <laughs> it means more cash flow uh, on the way through. So sometimes they might be um, just missing renovations or, or, you know, common areas can be claimed if you have, if someone's got some claims and they didn't. And sometimes in the past, accountants might just go, oh, yeah, there's a bit of depreciation. We'll just put a number on it. Um, I've seen that plenty of times. So go back and get it if you've been missing out because I don't know if those bikes spend it all that well. <laughs> so you might as well get it if you can, I think, um, effectively. Uh, look, touch on capital improvements repairs because uh, it's often a, a frequently asked question. Uh, if you do capital, if you um, do some capital improvements to a property, you improve it, then you need to depreciate it either at the building allowance or as plant equipment versus if you repair a property, you get to claim it straight away. Repairs. Instant deductions, they're better, obviously, but mm. it needs to be uh, repairs or maintenance officially. And if you do them straight after you buy the property, uh, I think they'll say 12 months, they knock them back because you bought it in disrepair already. Um, 
And I guess the we work with the accountants on the classification between those two things uh, and different accountants do different stuff here. Um, we don't fight with them over that. <laughs> um, but, you know, I guess a good example is if you... Um, if you've got a hole in your carpet and you replace the hole, fix the hole in your carpet, that's a repair. If you replace all your carpet because there's a hole in the carpet, it's new carpet. It's an improvement. <laughs> <laughs> hot water service breaks and doesn't work. You put a new one in, it's an improvement. If you fix the existing hot water serv service, it's a repair, basically. So yeah. we just work with that, lay the repairs out, put the put the things that are improvements in. And if the accountant wants to claim those repairs, otherwise we can always delete, take them off depreciation later. Um, we try to make them as right as we can, obviously, um, based on, you know, some grey legislation that different people interpret differently, I suppose, which is often the way it tax in this country. Um, look, important things to be, be aware of, I guess. We touched on inspections. Uh, we've been an advocate to make sure we inspect the properties and get them right. We found that uh, through with, with about 100,000 properties we assessed uh, through COVID, 66% of the time they had some sort of qualifying renovation after they were built. I mean, two-thirds of the time, if you just use the old costs from the start, you would miss that. Um, so I think making sure we get it right, making sure we get the most is what's important. Stick and buy it if you get an audit. Um, I can tell you when we pulled up on the day, because there's a GPS in the car, how long we spent there, and here's the photos, Mr. Tax Office. Um, uh, fairly confident on those. Clients get audited all the time and, and, and very confident that we're making sure we get them right. Yeah. Touched on the guarantee before, the fees tax deductible. That's important. Uh, so you get to claim that. Make sure they're compliant with the ATO. Um, and uh, we took, as we talked about, the, the, the fees, the, the average first year was just under $10,000 last year. We touched on the portal before and how you fix things. And I guess my BMT is what it is. So it's not a bad thing to, to touch on when you buy a depreciation schedule or when you get a quote, even you get an offer to log in, it's free to my BMT. In there, you can track what's going on. But you can, there's two key things around this is updating your live schedule. So you put a new air conditioner in, you want to be able to enter the cost and make it live for that year. Because when we do it, we project it out for the full life of the property. But when you replace an air conditioner in four years' time, then obviously the added up numbers at the bottom of the page are wrong for the next 36 years. <laughs> so uh, um, when you fix it up in here, it actually just fixes up all the numbers. And the other thing is in here, lots of the accountants have got access, got a login. And the accountants can see your uh, your depreciation schedules inside there. Yeah, put some other cool stuff in there so you can track income and expenses. I think I've got a slide on that. Um, if you're doing preparing for your tax return, you can put your costs and things in there and share those with your accountant. It's in the format the ATO has for my uh, makes it nice and easy. And there's also you can upload things in there if you want to. Um, uh, photos and receipts. Keep all your stuff in one place. Um, there's also some other market data. So nearby planning applications. If someone submits something to council to build a 20-storey high-rise, three doors up the road from your investment property, you might want to know about it. <laughs> uh, and this sends you an alert um, around your investment properties where you've yeah. had a schedule done. Uh, it's also got some AVMs or automatic valuations that come from some of the data houses that you can see against your property and sort of try to track a bit of the growth in the area over the time. Yeah, we uh, use your website quite a bit. The, uh, yeah. the pop calc is incredible. Yeah, I've got something on pop calc at a moment. Okay. Yeah, but it, it comes up. You know, those cash flow numbers we run at the start, you know, we used to, we um we have something to help investors with that. So we'll, we'll touch on that in a minute, Neil, yeah, but brilliant. that's great. Uh, inside my BMT, there, add your, add your stuff, add your carpet, add your things, pretty simple. Uh, and the things where you can see there's consensus data in there, the valuations, planning applications and your income expenses stay where you can put your stuff in there um, as, as to what you've spent through the year. But this is your income expenses Looks like what the my gov does. You can enter your stuff in here. It puts your depreciation number in there. It makes the preparation of your tax return fairly easy. Share that numbers with your accountant that you've entered rather than a shoebox through the year or a bunch of sheets all over the place. But I don't think it's a shoebox anymore. anymore. It's it's 75,000 PDFs. Yeah. <laughs> it's the new shoebox. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, you can see your properties in there and use all those things. The other thing, uh, yeah, as, you, as you just mentioned, Neil, prop count, we do all these, uh, used to do all these estimates of depreciation and how much uh, depreciation might be available to to, to buyers um, if they're buying something. And then they went, well, what does that mean? So we go, well, I don't know, let's build a calculator so you can actually go and calculate that. So Brilliant. this is a real way to ca calculate the after-tax cost of owning a particular investment property looking at. 
um, spits of depreciation. I'm in there, or you go to the calculator and get one if there's not enough data, um, another calculator. Uh, but this thing, you go through the details, the cost, the income, expenses, et cetera, put your own tax rates in there, what interest you're going to pay, all that sort of stuff, and it'll spit out the approximate cash flow. You can do some comparisons in there, gives you an idea of the rent, the growth and the median rents and those things. But you obviously just enter in your, your own numbers there and do some comparisons where you want to. Free app, free service inside my BMT, whichever you like. Helps you. And obviously you need depreciation to make the numbers work. So we'd love to talk to you after you do buy it. Uh, <laughs> depreciation calculators. There are a few apps here that are free you can use. Construction cost calculator if you're thinking of building stuff. Resi rates and rate finder gives you all those effective life in years that we talked about for how long things should last. Prop calc we just touched on there. Rep cost if you're insuring something, you need to insure it for the right amount. There's an app there that can help you with that that's uh, that's also uh, free. Um, and we are Connie Surveyor, so we put some construction cost signs into that. Um, uh, what to do it, talk to us. Let's make sure it's worth it. What are you doing? Renovating. Um, tell us about it. Talk to the property managers, get an inspection organised, prepare to appreciate it, it'll get it done. All pretty easy. Um, we take take care of most things where we can. We need a bit of information, obviously, to start. We need to know, you know, your property manager is and all that sort of stuff <laughs> um, and uh, what you've spent on the property outside of when you did buy it. Uh, that gives us to the end, I Fantastic. think. We've um, run through a couple of scenarios there. Hopefully there's a bit of learning in there Lots of towards the end, but... Um, Great to be here always. Thanks, Dan. Lots of information, mate. Lots of questions spinning around in my head as well. Um, the big one where you said we can get BMT, we call BMT because don't ever assume that it's too old to claim depreciation on. Um, so uh, some of our clients buy development sites where we buy, you know, one house that we're going to knock down and put two or three houses on there at the same time. Um, should we be contacting BMT for that? Yes, always, always, always. Yes, is contact. Will I yep. always get deductions out always. of it? Sometimes not. Uh, yep. But contact. Let's have a look and just tell us you're going to knock it over. Because if there's anything there, if there's a twenty year old kitchen that's got some value left, you knock it over. You might have a scrapping value of a certain amount of time. There's some other tax implications around if you'd sell the stock at the end. Um, there's potentially some uh, well clawback or for the easiest easiest way to do that. But so you got to be careful a couple of those things. But yeah, always. If in doubt, call, <laughs> and then we'll yes. tell you yeah. no, not worth it, or yes, worth it. And what about if, um, say, we know that property is a long term investment? You know, we want to hold these things for 20, 30, 40 years. Some people might claim depreciation and then sell after five years. What is the What are the implications that they need to consider if they're going to do that? Great question. Normally, I have it in the frequently asked questions section there, but it wasn't there today. <laughs> uh, sometimes it just complicates it. There is a um, so when you claim some of these claims in depreciation, you are reducing your cost base for the purpose of sale. So what happens if, is um, the depreciation you claim on the way through while owning that property uh, reduces your cost base by the amount you claim. So what will happen at the end is you will pay. Um, a capital gains tax on your gain. Hopefully you've made a gain over that period of time. And the depreciation you claimed will reduce your cost base so your gain will look higher um, or will be higher because your cost base is usually your purchase price mm -hmm. and then your sale price and there's a few adjustments, obviously. Uh, but your cost base or purchase price will be reduced by, if you've claimed 30000 in depreciation, you're going to pay tax, capital gains tax on an additional $30,000. Yeah. However, when you bought, when you sell a property with more than a year of ownership, generally what that means is you'll pay capital gains tax at half of your marginal rate. Uh, when you make these depreciation deductions on the way through, you make them at your full marginal rate, and you also get the money on the way through to get you get more money and you get it now. Yeah, but you do That's need good. to put some away for capital gains tax at the end. Yeah, um, yeah. use it to reduce interest and things like that on the way through, but. We've run, and, and Neil, like we can, um, they'll be on the website. We've run some case studies on that very thing, multiple over the years in our Maverick newsletters, where we actually do some calcs. You want to do some calcs on that? Um, you can. But And, and the, the things that we've run would sort of show you roughly how to do that, um, some of the things that are included that we've run in those over time. So there's case studies there. If you need them, reach out. We'll, um, we'll, uh, we'll find them for you. Fantastic. And lastly, my accountant says um, it's not about how much money you make. It's about how much money you keep. 
Um, and this is a great example of keeping some of that money instead of paying the tax man. As you've seen there, I think one of them was $22,000 that we would have kept in a deduction. That's that's a substantial amount of money. That's $22,000 that you can put towards the next deposit on your next property. Absolutely. Uh, it's it's a bit like, you, you know, what you keep. You don't pay capital gains tax unless you sell. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Right, <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah, it's brilliant. Um, and um, but yeah, what what you keep out of what you make is important. So the, the 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 tax they make it just makes a substantial difference. So you know, I've been doing this for nearly twenty five years, and the, the amount of money that people get to keep instead of <laughs> um, let um, someone else spend, uh, it's been substantial. Obviously, yeah, Brad, it's been. Really good catching up today, mate, and I've learned a lot. And I can guarantee the listeners will have learned a lot as well. Again, if you if you want to check this out, go over to the YouTube channel because there's lots of slides with lots of information in them. Uh, last question I've got for you, Brad, which I'm not sure if I actually told you I was going to ask this question, but if you had a million dollars to invest today, what state would you invest in and Ooh. what specifically would you invest in? Oh, uh, I've... I haven't really been, I just had a few days off. I wasn't thinking oh, yeah. about investing in property right now. <laughs> uh, I, I t- so I guess the answer is I, I've got finance ready through my property investing, especially in the later years whenever. And I'm probably there to buy and where, where, where it, when the market hurts, not when it's go, when it's flying. Yeah, but yeah. I, saying that, we've had that. We had COVID. I was busy trying to... Uh, uh, organize a business with a couple of hundred staff as opposed to going and buying property if I actually followed my own advice right there. Um, and where would I buy? I think, you know, New South Wales is, is is fairly cooked at the moment, so I'd need to see some hurt. I've got property across the eastern states uh, and I've been confident in all of them, but I, I'm, um, I'm not... Uh, you know, I, I wait for a bit of hurt before I do. And there's the property clock, there's all those things. I'm always looking for a bargain, so I'm probably buying more in areas that I understand, I yeah. suppose, often. Yeah. So where would I buy right now? I don't know. Um, I, I'd wait for New South Wales. I know WA's had plenty of hurt for a period of time mm. uh, and, and has probably seen some signs of recovery, so it's probably not bad. Uh, have I bought something there at the moment? No. Um, but... I just haven't, uh, you know, I just haven't had the time. I suppose it's one of the reasons, one of the issues. <laughs> anyway. Bradley, Bradley Beer, it's been an absolute pleasure catching up with you today, mate. And uh, hopefully, we can do it again in the future. Yeah, thanks, Neil. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.